guys, this is Phoebe Defiance coming at you from Mama Krishna's Carriage House, which is, if you don't know what that is, it's like, if this were the 1800s, there would probably be horses in here, and lots of hay, and presumably a carriage. But anyways, before I get into today's topic, I wanted to let you know about some shows I have coming up this week. Um, there's an I Feel Cameron show, it's going to be happening at the Colony with my friends Jib, or Jimmy, from Sonder. And Brianna Carmel, who is hosting the show, and uh, on behalf of 916 Growth Gigs, that's all her. And she also started vlogging. And as soon as I'm done watching or doing this vlog, I want to go watch hers. And uh, that's going to be good. And that's right. I'm plugging you, Brianna, before I've even seen your video, because that is how much faith I have in you. So uh, look forward to that. Oh, and also, Melissa from the Desperado video that I showed you last week. She's gonna be playing too. And she has a really cool band name, but I didn't write it down. Melissa Schiller and the, the Bling Boys. Melissa Schiller and the Baker Miller Pinks. And so we're all gonna be playing a show together on Thursday and it's going to be rad. And then I have Dandelion Massacre shows on Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday, I'll be in Oakdale at the Batcave for the Miss Outs and their album release party. That is also out right now. Uh, I will put the link in the description so that you can download it. Finally, on Sunday, we have Dandelion Massacre at Cafe Colonial in Sacramento, California with She, Her, Hers, and Raccoon Venom. And they are really cool folk punk friends, and I'm so excited to hug them because I haven't seen them since tour, I'm pretty sure. Oh man, yeah, we played a show together in Portland and Kevin uh, broke his watch and basically we all stepped on it. I guess I already talked about that, but it just, it's stuck in my mind so much. It's like, ah, like, you know, destruction really sticks with you. On that note, I want to get into today's topic. Okay, first, I just want to say that this video is probably going to be very, very, very heavily edited because this is like way harder for me to talk about than I imagined for some reason. I thought I could just flip on the camera and be like, hey guys, I want to talk about my trauma. What's up? But that's, that's not happening. <laughs> but um, the reason why this video is late and why I've been just so hesitant this past, like these past two weeks is because last week, was the anniversary of my suicide attempt. And I'm going to tell you all about it. I wanna tell you everything that I remember about that day and just how I've been feeling since and how I've, I felt on my anniversary. And um, so I hope that's okay with you. And if this is like too much or too heavy for you, I totally understand if you wanna just go to a different video and watch me do a Jeff Rosenstock cover. For those of you that do stay tuned in, thank you. I really, I hope, I hope that this does something for you. Okay. And first of all, the thing that I think is most important to bring up is that I was on birth control. I was taking the pill that you take every day, and I feel like being on that medication really was damaging so if you knew me like around the time that I was like 18 19 and I was being like a like a low-key sociopath I am really sorry and I am not on that birth control anymore but um yeah I feel like my birth control had made me really chemically imbalanced and um I was trying to go to school at the time because I wanted to be a physicist so that I could learn time travel and that's honestly still a life goal that I have because this is a crazy world. I truly believe that we are living in the darkest timeline. And in any other timeline, I don't think I'd be able to time travel. I think this is the one where I time travel. Or one that's like in a neighboring dimension. So I'm just going to get that out of the way. Let you know. I am pro time travel. And um, as soon as I can, I will one day build my time machine. And I will go to Stephen Hawking's uh, time travel party and your mind's gonna be blown. <laughs> Sorry, I got off track. But um, actually, time travel really ties into the story, so <laughs> um, I'll get back to that later. But, um, so I was in school, I was going to community college, and I was doing really bad at math, and I'd also, oh God, there were so many factors. I had been in a car accident uh, just like about a month before, and so I had a concussion at some point and my body was just like physically exhausted from being in that car accident 
And then to top it all off, um, I, my cell phone got stolen. And that's important because that morning I woke up by myself and I just, I didn't have anyone to talk to and I was in a weird mood. Like, I couldn't, like, open up my phone and, like, laugh at a meme and, like, carry on about my day. But it probably could have really helped me now that I think about it. And so, and then on top of that, there was just a lot of weird things going on in my house. Like, my mom uh, was having, um, I think she had, like, some sort of breast cancer, and so she had to get, she was having to, like, go to the doctor and like have surgeries and stuff and that was just like pfft, that was a lot to deal with because my mom is one of my favorite people in the world so here we are we have 19 year old phoebe trying to go to school on on weird birth control on adderall no phone and nobody around to console her and i don't know i just i had this feeling in my chest that like Today was going to be the day. And I don't know what put that thought in my head. I just kind of woke up with it. And my cat was there. And I remember just, like, looking at him. And just, like... It was... It's just astounding to me in hindsight that I just had so little regard for my life. And I'm really grateful that I don't feel that way anymore. Even at my worst, it's like this weird sinking feeling. Like, I didn't even feel like myself. I felt like I was in a trance. And so, what I did was I put on my favorite dress and I put my ukulele on my back because I'm punk rock. I wanted to die with my instrument in my hand. <laughs> it's really corny now that I think about it. But I put my instrument on my back and I got all of the pills from the medicine cabinet and I gobbled them all up and I was like, that probably isn't enough. I should probably eat a little bit of Tylenol also and so I put some of that in me too not the whole bottle though and then sometimes I wonder that if I had eaten the whole bottle of Tylenol if I would have died but um okay so what happened I took the I took the, all the pills and I put on my cute dress and I put on my ukulele and then I realized that my siblings are really young they're like 10, 11 and 12 years younger than me and I was like I don't want them to find my body and I don't want my parents to find my body and I'm, my grandpa lived next door to the house uh, to my family's house and so I was like I don't want him to find me and so um, like I said I didn't have a phone but my brother and sister they had like a little phone that had like minutes on it and you can dial any uh, 911 on any phone and so I dialed 911 and I think the fact that I did that means that some part of me had some will to live but I dialed 911 and I was like hey guys I just took a bunch of pills and I'm gonna go die now and I was just wondering if you would send somebody over so that um, my family won't find me like I would prefer if somebody that was more familiar with corpses would uh, come in and uh, take me away and they were like what the fuck no stay on the line and I'm like no no I already did it I'm gonna I'm gonna go die now guys and they're like please stay on the line and I'm like nope I just wanted to let you know this is where I live okay goodbye forever this was on my family's um on my family's farm they live like on a cotton alfalfa farm and so I just walked out into the alfalfa field I'm just gonna curl up in a ball and just die in this ditch like that's what's more folk punk than dying in a ditch and so I curled up in a ball and I'm like yeah I'm gonna die now finally 2015 to forever <sighs> and then I hear the sirens I don't know how much time it passed it probably wasn't that much time. So I wake up, but it's all like super hazy. It feels like I'm like half asleep and there's, there are paramedics over me and there is, and there's a sheriff for some reason. And he's like all cop-like and he's like, you need to get up, ma'am. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna get up, I'm dead. That part was like really hazy and it really felt like a dream. And then I heard my grandpa's voice in the background, like, behind them. And he's like, come on, Phoebe, get up. And I'm like, ah, of course, 
they went to him because he was probably home and they probably went to his address and was like, hey, there's a dead girl around here somewhere. Do you know where she might be? And to this day, I still feel really guilty that he got dragged into that because my grandpa is a very wholesome, hardworking person and he probably doesn't really, you know, think about just the world in that in any sinister way ever. And so I feel bad that I dragged him into that. And I felt bad when I heard his voice, and I was like, ah, okay, I guess I'll get into the ambulance. And so, me, I was really drugged out, and I remember being like, okay, cop, I'll get up, but only if you carry me just married style over the threshold. Like, I love being carried like that, and I hate cops, but, you know, he was so insistent on me getting he was so insistent on me standing up i was like i might as well use this to my advantage and he was like no you have to stand up and i'm like "Ah, no you have to carry me like we're just married and he was like no and so i remember them hoisting me up and then them putting me in the ambulance and i have this problem where i'm really rude to paramedics because Usually, if I think that I'm about to die, I think that that's my right. (laughs) Oh my god, I can't believe I'm telling you this. This lady, she's very understanding. She's like, it's my job to keep you alive. And I'm like, this is my body, and I'm autonomous. And if I want to die, then I should die. And she's like, no, I can't let you do that. And I'm like, let me die. And that's really the last thing that I remember from that day. Except I hadn't, I'm so bad at math that I didn't even take enough to poison myself that badly. And so they didn't like have to pump my stomach to get the pills out or anything. They gave me like charcoal to eat. And I remember I have, I remember like coming to and I'm sitting up and I have this charcoal like in my mouth. And then I'm like, what ew gross and I remember putting it back and then the next thing that I remember was waking up in a hospital and um (laughs) none of my friends knew where I was and so I had to get a hold of of Terrell who I was dating at the time but I didn't remember his number but I remembered my exes (laughs) And so me being, I'm basically like recovering from being extremely messed out from the Adderall. And so (laughs) I call up my ex and I'm like, hi, I'm in the mental hospital and your number is the only number that I remember. Will you tell Terrell that I am in here? (laughs) And will you tell him to call me? And she was like, what the hell okay (laughs) oh my god that is so embarrassing it's so like silly like when you kill yourself people always say that it's like a selfish thing or whatever and suicidal people are always just like no it's rude to say that it's selfish like you know but when you're mentally ill you really don't think about like how many other people are involved (laughs) like people that love you really care when shit happens to you (laughs) oh my god so Terrell calls me on the little payphone in the hospital and uh, I don't know I don't even really remember any conversations that I had in the hospital I just remember we were having group therapy And, um, our, I don't remember if it was a patient or if it was a nurse that brought it up. No, it was a nurse. And they said that it was a good thing that none of us died because people that commit suicide go to hell. And I'm like, me, the scientist, the scientist, and the group is like, excuse me, uh, there isn't a hell. And, um, it is probably, I didn't say this, but in hindsight, I'm just like, If somebody wants to die, like, so badly, like, why would you tell them that they're going to hell? Like, that's supposed to, like, make you complicit in your life? 
It's like, oh, well, if you try to leave this hell on earth, then you'll just go to a worse place. Like, that doesn't, that just seems like a really sad thing to tell people that are already really sad to begin with. And also, like, this is a medical institution, and it's not a medical fact that if you kill yourself, you'll go to hell. So, fuck you, Kuiya Delta Mental Institution and whatever nurse that was. You're really lucky that I was too high to remember your name. Otherwise, I would be putting you on blast right now. So I was there for 72 hours, and I had a pretty cool therapist, and his name was Dr. Gorlick. And I honestly thought that he was a pretty cool guy, and I'm really grateful to have had him, unlike that nurse. But, um... He diagnosed me with cyclothymia, which is a less popular type of bipolar disorder. It's different from bipolar 1 or 2 because you don't have, like, mood swings over, like, days or years, but you just have them, like, in instances. It's like one minute you can be like, ah, and the next minute you can be like, ah, and <laughs> anybody that knows me knows that that is definitely a thing that I do. And, um... Also, he said something that, like, really stuck out to me, and he said that there is no medical cure for existential nihilism. And when he first told me that, I was like, bro, that's so deep. My sickness is so special. But now that I'm, like, an adult and I'm look looking back and I'm like, well, that's a bleak thing to say. <laughs> like, damn. Also, there is a cure for existential nihilism, and it's just, I don't know, I think it's just, like, reading philosophy, honestly. <laughs> just knowing that, like, no matter what you do in life, as long as you do your best, your life was well lived. And that if you didn't do your best, then it's probably not your fault. So yeah, I'm in the hospital for 72 hours. And um, I probably should have stayed longer, but I don't like staying at mental hospitals very long because, well, you can't hug people, and if you're on suicide watch, they won't let you use pens. And those are, like, two of my favorite things. I love hugs, and I love pens. And I couldn't have either of them, and I missed my friends, and I missed my mom, and so I was like, I'm better, let me go, please. And I made plans with Carol to go hang out with him after I got out of the hospital because, you know, I loved him and I wanted to see him. And so I took the train to go see him. And on the train ride, I listened to Jeff Rosenstock's, at the time, new album called We Cool. And I never really listened to Jeff Rosenstock before. I heard, like, a couple of Bond the Music Industry songs and I was like, oh yeah, Scott, whatever. You know, like, the imbecile that I was. I didn't realize how amazing and perfect Bomb the music, indu music Industry was. And so I'm on the train and I put on, I put on We Cool and I don't know anything about Jeff. Like, I don't even think I knew that he was the Bomb the Music Industry guy at the time. And so it's like, first track, whatever, da 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 Da, 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 da. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. This is cool. And I'm going through all the tracks. And the song that gets me, you're not going to believe this, is Polar Bear Africa. And to this day, that is still my favorite Jeff Rosenstock song. And so I'm, I'm on the train. And the song is just digging into me, like digging into my soul after just having got out of the hospital. And then it gets to that part. We're gonna give them the trip to the hospital. We're gonna give them the bills for the funeral. We're gonna give them the debt from the student loans. We're gonna give them what's left of the shit we own. And there are just ugly tears streaming down my face. And so I have to get up from my seat and go to the bathroom just to gather myself. And I'm just like... Oh my god, Jeff, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I'm really glad that that was the first thing that I listened to when I got out of the hospital. Like, if nothing before had tethered me to life, tethered me to this existence, it was that song. It was Polar Bear Africa by Jeff Rosenstock. Like, after all of the weird things that I had been through... It was just such a relief. 
to just hear somebody that under hear somebody that understood. I felt really understood by that song. So thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I don't know how to tie this in, but um, part of why I believe that I am I will actually time travel at some point, probably in this dimension, but possibly in other dimensions, is because when okay. When the ambulance came to get me, my siblings were also getting home from school, and their school bus usually pulls up right in front of the house, and my ambulance, the ambulance was right in front of the house at the time. And I feel like it would have been so traumatic for them, and all of the kids that were also on the school bus to, like, see an ambulance outside of Major and Valen's house, like, you know, that would have been so weird for them to have had discuss to discuss with, like, other, like, little elementary school kids. But they, the school bus didn't pull up in front of the house or onto the block at all like it normally would because a telephone pole fell down after I had overdosed. And so there was a telephone pole blocking the street that I lived on, and so the school bus couldn't get to where my house was, and so they couldn't see that they couldn't see the ambulance and nobody knew what was going on they were like oh there's a telephone pull down whatever and so i would i have this theory that i went back in time to the point where i attempted suicide and i pushed over the telephone pole somehow so that my siblings couldn't see me outside the ambulance because i apparently there is a universe out there where they did see the ambulance and had to explain it to all the ele other elementary school kids and shit was just wild and i don't know like they hate hated me or were like traumatized or something and i'm really grateful for that telephone poll and i'm grateful that it keeps me determined to one day go back to school <laughs> to finally figure out the mysteries of time travel on the other hand I also think that if we ever do discover time travel, that you won't be able to go backwards, but we'll see. We'll see. <sighs> okay, so last week was the anniversary of that whole fiasco, and it really, like, took a toll on me for some reason in a way that it hadn't the year before, the year before that. And so I wrote down a bunch, a couple of questions that I had, and I don't have the answers to them. But, and I couldn't really find any answers that I was looking for online. And so if you have anything that you would like to say in response to these questions, uh, drop some in the comments or maybe make your own video and uh, let me know what you think. Um, shouldn't I feel further away from it? Especially after, you know, after years have gone by, I feel closer to it than ever for some reason. Which is part of why I wanted to make this video, is because I feel like if I get it, like, all out there in the open, then it might even become bigger than me or smaller than me, and I can go bloop! And, um, what can I do to make life feel more fulfilling? Which I guess kind of answers the previous question, because it's like, if I, maybe, if I had felt more fulfilled, then I wouldn't feel so close to it. But also, like... I'm not doing anything like immediately right now except talking into a camera, but I'm in some really good bands, if I do say so myself. I think the people that I make music with are very talented and very creative, and that in itself is fulfilling. And I toured across the country, and that was really fulfilling. That like spiritually like had an effect on me. Months after I had this suicide attempt, I met the person that I was that I'm go that I ended up marrying. I met my best friend and I moved to my favorite city in the entire world. And that's fulfilling. And so I guess another question I would have is what can I do to remember that I do have so much to live for? What can we all do? Cuz I know like even if you're not like attempting to kill yourself, it's still hard to, you know, see the good in the world and the good in your own life personally. Oh yeah, that was another thought that I had. Is that like, I have this joke that like I actually died on that day and that 
I have like a new birthday. Like I have like the day that I was born in like 1994 and then I have the day that I was born in 2015 or like I was rebirthed and made recommitted to life. <laughs> Every holiday has rituals. On Christmas, you open presents, and on anniversaries, you open champagne, and on your birthday, you blow out candles. There's no sort of ritual for, hey, you made it another year when you didn't want to, and I think that there should be anniversary of your suicide attempt rituals, Hallmark cards, um, party favors. I want to make that happen because I feel like part of what makes suicide survivors so stigmatized is that nobody talks about these things. You know, maybe what better way to talk about it than through celebration? What else do I have written here? What can we do to sustain our commitments to life in this ever stressful, evil world we live in? Well, the world is not evil. It's got evil in it, but like, look at ball cat. It's, there's no evil here. I guess that's all I have for now. If you have anything else that you'd like to add or like anything that you want to say, um, let me know. I feel better just having talked about it. Like when I first, before I started recording, I was like crying. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And now that I've done it, I feel unburdened. And um, I also encourage anybody else that feels like they're ready to. So if you've gone through any sort of overdoses or suicide attempts, like, you know, I encourage you to tell people about it because I really think it'll make you feel better. Not even like a therapist or anything. You should probably see a therapist if you can. Like we didn't always have therapists. Like before, like when we sat around fires, we just had each other. And I feel like this is kind of the same thing, except instead of standing around a fire with a bunch of people, we're all far away standing around a bunch of laptops. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Like I said, I'm really happy that we're all here on this earth together. And I, if there's anything that I can do to help you get through it, just please feel free to reach out to me because I may not know exactly what you're going through, but I know what it's like to just feel ready to die and I know what it's like to feel like there's nowhere else to go and that there's nothing for you in this world anymore and if you've ever felt that way I'm really sorry and just remember that you're loved I love you maybe if we've never even met like I feel close to you in my heart and I believe that we're gonna get through this world together thanks for watching have a good week and I will be here next week probably ready to say something else that's crazy. <laughs> All right, good night.